Hello everyone. We have Kevin Roos today joining us uh, in the show. So Kevin is a technology columnist at New York Times and host of the popular podcast Rabbit Hole. He's authored three books and his latest is Future Proof which is getting great reviews. And today we'll be talking about a lot of topics related to his latest book. Uh welcome Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. My pleasure. Uh, so uh when I look at Future Proof it greatly resonated with me when i uh, take the view of a consumer of ai uh, i'm obsessed with productivity or i run thought experiments uh, to skip technology for some days so that way it, it resonated with some of the suggestions you share in the book as well it is in the introduction um, in uh, to your book you talk about some common narratives that technologists share about automation uh, as a technologist and an optimist i've been peddling <laughs> some of these narratives myself i still do so uh, three of those i wanted to go over and find out what you disagree uh, about these narratives firstly uh, humans must collaborate with ai rather than compete with it so when we build ai solutions uh, in my firm we've always seen that uh, augmented analytics or augmented intelligence is far more powerful when you bring humans and ai together the effectiveness is much superior um so which part of this would you uh, do you think is misleading well i should say i don't think this is always misleading i think there are instances in which humans and ai can work together but the research is pretty clear that this is usually just a temporary solution because ultimately with tasks that are automatable the ai just learns to be better on its own and actually at some point humans become a drag on the efficiency of the system. Um so this is true in all kinds of disciplines um you know loan origination risk uh you know assessment um all these things can now be done much more effectively by by machines and if you introduce humans into them you actually degrade the outcomes. Um but there's also this kind of commercial um angle to this that I think is important which is that a lot of businesses who are applying automation don't want it to augment humans they want it to replace them they don't want to pay for a human salary and a piece of software they want to use the software to make it unnecessary to employ the human um in those cases where you you're seeing the march of ai the extent of automation is increasing so you're saying that in the in the longer run most of these jobs will be completely automated away so that's that's the concern you see well completely automated away or just transformed um in ways that are that that make them you know less um less remunerative rat less fulfilling um you know one thing that i think we get wrong in this automation debate and discussion is assuming that as long as people's jobs don't disappear mm-hmm. um then everything's good as long as people have jobs as long as there's not mass unemployment then mm-hmm. we're okay in reality automation more often than not changes jobs and it can change them in ways that are positive and it can change them in ways that are negative and so what i'm interested in looking at is not just what jobs are disappearing but what jobs are being transformed and how are they being transformed and are they better after than they were before are people being paid more do they have more freedom and flexibility are they contributing more are they happier um or are they are they not doing as well okay yeah fair point all of these are important subtle aspects we'll have to pay attention to that actually leads to the second narrative um doesn't technology always create more jobs than what it destroys we have seen many popular examples the internet uh, seo and uh, social media and there are new roles you you mentioned about it in the book uh, so there are uh, so i i believe that probably there are so many other roles in the future which would uh, come up which we are not even aware of today right right so i think there are two ways to answer this and i'll take the first way first which is that let's just let's look at the research on what is actually happening to jobs there's some great um research out from a pair of economists uh Daron Asamoglu and Pascal Restrepo who looked at actually in the industries where automation has been happening um over the past few decades what is the rate of new tasks being created versus old tasks being displaced by that automation and they found that actually since the late 1980s the balance has tipped we are now displacing tasks in industries that are automating faster than we are creating new tasks out of that automation mm-hmm. and so that's a worrisome trend but let's just bracket that for a second and say even if what happens this time in this revolution this fourth industrial revolution is the same as what's happened in the past three industrial revolutions mm-hmm. 
Are, is that okay? Are we okay with that? Because after all, we have better lives now than our grandparents did. We, we right. don't work in the farms. We don't, you know, we would not, I, I don't think many people in 2021 would trade lives with someone living 200 years ago. So clearly there's progress. The problem is that that progress doesn't arrive all at once. Yep. So in the Industrial Revolution, for example, it was about 50 years from the start of industrialization until workers' wages actually rose in proportion to corporate profits. So there was a 50-year period where workers were being more productive. They were producing more value for their companies. These factories were being very profitable, but workers weren't actually seeing the benefits of that in any way. So what we have to ask ourselves now is, sure, maybe over the long run, all this technology is going to make our lives better, but what is the experience of the workers who are actually going through this? Are they happier? Are they better paid? Are they safer? Are they doing better than they were before all this technology came in? And that actually brings us to the question, um, do you think is there an alternate path uh, to automation and use of technologies like AI? Uh, is there a way to usher in progress? Um, without creating the short-term pain? There are definitely ways to make it go smoother. So one of the examples that I found really inspiring, um, actually, is what happened in the 20th century of automation when factories were implementing robotics for the first time in the 1960s and 70s. And actually there, we didn't see this 50-year gap between increased productivity and GDP and corporate profits and workers' wages. We actually saw it tracking pretty closely where, you know, corporations were making more money, but workers were also making more money and getting their quality of life improved. And a lot of that has to do with unions and the industries that we're automating were largely manufacturing, car making, um, you know, metal uh, making, um, forges and things like that. These were, these were industries that were unionized and workers were able to fight for a bigger share of the increased pie. There are three parts to it, uh, the way I see it from your answer. One uh, is the unionization as an example, the, the, how employees can protect themselves. Second aspect is a responsible use of technology by companies and, and compensating the workers uh, from the organization standpoint. And third, uh, perhaps the regulatory aspects, how, how the markets are regulated. So maybe all these three coming together, uh, would it be fair to say that that can smoothen some of these, uh, the short-term disruption and pains? Absolutely. I mean, we could take that 50-year window from the Industrial Revolution down to five or 10 years or maybe even less. Um, but we have to approach it the right way. Okay, yep. Uh, so the, the other related question I have is when you look at um, organizational leaders, so they have the, the means to automate and take care of costs, though it is uh, not the right thing to do. And they have pressure from investors, um, the markets for efficiencies and more profits. And third, they have employees and, and the larger society and stakeholders to take care of. So what would be your recommendation for organizations and leaders, uh, how should they approach this? Well, I think the first step is to involve workers whenever possible and as early as possible. Um, there's a, a great um, story I wrote about in the book where there was a factory in Lordstown, Ohio in the 1970s where they were implementing automation for the first time. This was in Lordstown, Ohio. It was the Lordstown GM plant and they were the most technologically sophisticated plant in America. It was basically like, you know, the Google of its time. And they had all this amazing robotics and automation and they implemented it and workers were taken by surprise and they hated it. They didn't yeah. like it at all. And they, it wasn't just that they were sort of afraid of new technology is that it was making their jobs worse and harder and less interesting. It wasn't augmenting them as, as you talked about, it was actually degrading them and making, turning them into essentially, you know, babysitters for these robots and they went on strike they rebelled and mm -hmm. cost the company billions of dollars uh took you know several weeks to resolve and and um you know eventually they they won some concessions and they formed these worker automation councils where you know workers on the assembly line could hear about new technology could advise management on how to make their jobs easier using new technology so that when the automation came in it wasn't seen as a threat it was seen as something to help them. Yeah. And so I think that's a, that's a great point. Uh, involving the workers and, and building that trust uh, so that they um, are taken along. 
you talk about uh, again in the uh, parts of the book you talk about profit hungry executives making irresponsible choices so uh, i think that's a probably uh, maybe it fit, fits many companies and many executives but i think uh, i i hope you came across some good examples in your research so can you share instances of organizations or leaders who are doing this automation right Well, I I don't think all executives are profit hungry, uh, irresponsible, you know, unethical monsters. Um, okay. And I do think there are a number of employees that are or em- employers and executives who are seeing the way that the economy is shifting toward human value and are responding accordingly. One of the companies I wrote about in the book is Best Buy, the big big box, you know, electronics retailer. and they were supposed to die like amazon was supposed to kill them the way that it killed a lot of other big box retailers and it didn't die in fact it's been doing great and so i was curious i just said like what did they do how did they survive this technological change that was supposed to make them obsolete so i talked to the ceo this guy for, former ceo this guy named uh, hubert joly and he told me that basically the way they had succeeded and 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 avoided dying at amazon's hands was that they focused on human interactions they created this in-home advisor program where they would send someone to your house to tell you you know which brand of speakers to buy or you know which projector was going to get you the best picture you know which which you know lights to put on your patio that kind of advisory sort of consulting service um, and that was a hugely successful program. program because people there it turned out there was a big demand for something that Amazon wasn't doing they weren't sending people to your house to teach you how to mount your TV like they were they just didn't have that capability but it turned out there was a big market for that human connection and that's where Best Buy could sort of fill the void in the market so that's what they did and it was extremely successful and i've been inspired by a lot of other stories like that of companies that realized like we can't compete on efficiency we can't compete on price but we can compete on humanity that's a great example and that brings in the the human touch and human uh, interaction element which uh, technology can uh, may not be able to fulfill uh, even in the future last question uh, you've based on the market research you've done in this book and you've come across uh, so many references So are there any frameworks or blueprints um that organizations can take to approach this I'm, I'm sure leaders will be facing all of these pressures uh we talked about the investor pressure and 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 the opportunities which may not be the right path to take but they have them within arms reach um so what um, if they have to plan this on a quarter and quarter basis and still satisfy the different stakeholders are there any frameworks or blueprints you've come across Yeah I would actually go back if I were Uh, an executive at a company that was automating i would go back and look at the the studies and the research and the books and the you know the the magazine stories that were written about previous waves of automation there's been a you know we we were not starting from scratch here this has been happening for hundreds of years and there are a lot of lessons that you know executives and and business leaders can learn from executives and business leaders of a different generation maybe they're you know factory workers and and executives in the 1960s and 70s maybe it's you know employers that had to transition to PCs in the 80s and 90s um or transition onto the internet i mean this is um this is not an unprecedented event in our economy mm-hmm. and we know that there are you know ways that it can go better and there are ways that it can go worse and so i think there's lots of blueprints out there there i can there's a big list um at, at the end of my book there's a reading list of okay. all the books that i found really helpful in looking back at the history of automation and and um and labor and uh and there's some great stuff in there that i encourage people to check out sure yeah i'll I'll, uh, i'll link to some of those and uh, i think that this is a good point uh, ultimately it is change management um, and how you uh, manage change whether it is uh, in within an organization or in the entire industry or even larger than that if you go back and look at uh, how leaders have navigated whether it is organizational leaders or country uh, heads of uh, governments how, how have they navigated this i think they would give uh, they would serve as good examples uh thank you kevin it's been a pleasure talking to you and thanks for sharing so your so much fun <laughs> thank you for having me take care